Good morning, everyone, and welcome on this beautiful Monday, July the 19th, 2021, and welcome to this special edition of the 1111 AM Fireside Chat, which features our Richfield Roundtable. This is our very first presentation in which we are having one of our very own from our flock to share information and experiences from his career as a U.S. Forest Service Forest Ranger. Um, and so therefore, this is a presentation of our Geese Speaks program as a member of our flock, Mr. Robert Thank you, Bob Lockhart. Welcome, Mr. Lockhart. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here with us today. And as I mentioned, Mr. Lockhart served for more than, uh, worked for the United States Forest Service, and he served for over 25 years in various capacities, as he will explain as well. Um, he was involved in even um, starting a program of study of forestry for a local community college. So he is well versed in the area of forestry. And as we continue to hear about all of the forest fires that are happening throughout the uh, Midwest now, I think there are over 70 forest fires that were reported on this morning's news with millions of acres being affected as well as millions of people that are being affected. This is a, a very important topic mm -hmm. and we are so thankful for Mr. Lockhart being here with us today to share vital information. So Mr. Lockhart, once again, we welcome you. It's been a pleasure okay. to work with you on this, on this program. I've learned a lot just from our discussions about um, your being, being here today. So I would just like to start with asking you to tell us a little bit about yourself, such as where you were born and educated and um, how you got into forestry. Okay. I'm a native West Virginian. I was born in Ravenswood, West Virginia, but I grew up in Parkersburg, West Virginia. I then went to West Virginia University in Morgantown. I graduated in 1953. I enlisted in the Army during the Korean War, but I ended up serving in Germany. When I came back in 19. 55, my first job happened to be on the George Washington Forest, which is part of this forest here now, in a little town called Buena Vista. <laughs> it was a great place to start. It's a beautiful district as far as the land is things are controlled. But after that, things started moving pretty fast in the Forest Service. I was the first one that had been hired for over two year period. And so it was about two months after I came in that kind of the dam broke and they started hiring people one after the other. We had a timber sale starting on that district for 81 million feet. One of the, the biggest one they had ever had in the region and there was three of us that worked on that particular sale most of the time. We had a lot of other things to do too, so sometimes we had, had a little conflicts with what had to be done and what we could do. But then, a lot of people refer to me as a hillbilly from West Virginia. I don't take that derogatory. I take it as a sign of respect. I've been called things like that. Most of them trying to just ruffle my feathers a little bit. I don't pay any attention. Anyhow, so that's how I got started. Then part way through my career, the fellow that was the president of the community college at Clifton Forge had been after me for two years to come and start a, a forest technology program for two-year people. 
So I finally resigned from the Forest Service in 1910, or 1910. Not little quite late, that little early. later than that. It was in, yeah, 20, uh, 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 I said not quite that no, early, no, huh? No, no, no. <laughs> so I went there and set, that, set up that program and ran it for almost five years. And then I went back to the Forest Service. And I had been working in National Forest Administration, but when I went back, the only job they had left there available right at that time was in what they call state and private forestry. So, so that's what I did for a while. Awesome. Now, being from um, beautiful West Virginia probably helped to, uh, you probably spent lots of time in the natural environment. And was that something that contributed to your love of nature? I wanted to be a forest ranger, but I can't, I was pretty small when I still thought that. It's still, in my opinion, of all the jobs I had in the Forest Service, and there was a bunch of them, that the, dis the part of being a district ranger was the most enjoyable one. It's the hardest working part of, I can guarantee that, because I've seen all these different offices that I've held. And uh, so I'll just tell you a little bit about what happened then. I was transferred from Buena Vista to a forest in Pennsylvania called the Allegheny. And I went to a district in Marionville, then was transferred over to, to uh, Ridgeway, and I had to set up a brand new district. I hadn't been in the Forest Service all that long. But after that, then I was sent back to Virginia, in Kentucky, into uh, Cl uh, Covington, Virginia, which is not too far from us here. And I served there for six years and was sent into the regional office in Upper Darby, Pennsylvania. Then was sent to the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. And then went to Southern Illinois and went to the chief's office. And that's when I, I resigned and ran the school. And then after I left that, I went back to the Forest Service and it was back to Upper Darby again. And then later on, I went over to Cadillac, Michigan. So my wife and I got pretty good at packing furniture. She was really good. I just carried the stuff over and said, where do you want it? And, and that's what she put in the box, yeah. Wow, yeah. yes, you, you have covered a lot of the country. Um, and spent a lot of times in the forest throughout the um, eastern half of the of the country and Midwest. Right. So that was probably an exciting time for you. It was. We got to, we got to see a lot of different country, beautiful places. Mm -hmm. And uh, well, let's start off this way. A lot of people don't remember that there's two different units here. That, there's a, the Park Service and the Forest Service. The Park Service deals with national parks, national monuments, things like that, and it's all designed towards preservation. The Forest Service is conservation, the wise use of the land. So the Park Service, they enforce their own laws. We don't with the Forest Service. We're concurrent with whatever the local jurisdiction is, and we get them to work with us. We help them, and they help us. So that's, that's the way it goes. Now, speaking of law enforcement, one of the jobs I had when I worked in the Washington office was to head up a program to determine whether the Forest Service should have law enforcement people on their staff. So I did that, and they decided, yes, we're going to start having forest officers carry, the, carry a gun. I was head of the recreation that time on a forest, and I was able to get one of our fellows the ability to carry a weapon. And you say, well, why do you need a weapon? Well, 
when you're out in all this open land places, there's not any protection other than yourself. And some people, I have to say it, the ones that caused us the most trouble happened to be females. And what made them so belligerent was they would, would drink. Well, in, Pencil, in uh, Cadillac, Michigan, for example, we had a lot of beautiful rivers to canoe on. And some of them wouldn't be any wider than this, this row of chairs right here. And the water may be only that deep. But you can imagine people tipping over in canoes and everything, besides dragging along an inner tube with a case of beer in an extra canoe, extra tube. So one of the things I did there was I had to come in and see what could be done on this one particular river that was taking down on a weekend over a thousand canoes on a weekend. And it was just all these metal canoes hitting rocks and banging into each other, you know, you could hear noise for, seemed like for miles to go down there. Anyhow, I cut it in half. I called it all the canoe deliveries in, I think there was eight or nine of them. And I said, we gotta get control of this. This is not meeting the qualifications we would like to see happen on these rivers. So we're gonna cut it and we'll sit in a quota of 500 canoes a day on the weekend, each day on the weekend. So I said, I think the fairest, fairest way to do it is just if uh, everybody take a percentage, say 10% of what canoes they have, you have, and deduct it. Everybody do the same way. So this one guy pops up and says, he turned out to be the head of the, the group of canoeists in the state. He says, can we meet him in a few minutes? by ourselves, and I said, sure. So they came back in, and I said, what do you decide? They decided we'd each take a, the same number. I said, you sure you want to do that? Yep, that's what we want. I said, okay, that's what you're going to get, and we're not going to, I'm not going to revisit this decision for another year, so, you, so don't come to me and later and say we made a mistake. I said, that's the way it's going to be for a year. So the way they went. Sure enough, it was about a month later, there's a few started coming in and say, we shouldn't have agreed to that. I said, that's what I was trying to tell you and you wouldn't pay attention. So anyhow, we finally got control of it. And so that's just one of, the, one of the problems we have. But the National Forest, if you want to know exactly how that operates, there's three branches. There's National Forest Administration that just deals with the National Forest. You have research, which does all the research in different places on the forest around the country, and the state and private. And that's where we provide advice to state organizations. Now, I always had a question, why, why are we providing advice to the state? They, have, they went to the same college as we went to, why should we do that? And a lot of them would tell me the same thing. Why are you being like big uncle to us? Well, there was money that flowed through from our agency into them to do certain things. And we also had a group that I belong to called the Management Assistance and Other Related Activities. They didn't have that kind of a thing. So there's three of us that went around and spoke to their individual groups in a state you, by, the, by their request. We didn't say we'd like to come out and talk to you. They came to us. And so we would go out and we'd spend a week long deal. We'd come in on a Monday and leave Friday afternoon. And it went during the day and in the evenings. And uh, now this is a map you, of the United States I don't know if you can see this here. very well, but there's red ones, blue ones, yellow ones. Can that even show up at all on there? Well, anyhow, we covered 
there was, there's 20 states here in this area right here. And we covered 18 of them anyhow, putting on these, these programs. And we got on to other things. Now the red, red ones here are places where I was on large fires, the really big ones. And the yellow places are where I was stationed. Here, 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 and out there in Boise, Idaho. The forest, if you take a, draw a line right down the middle right here, this is the east, and that's the west. If you, well, let me back up a minute first here. Would anybody guess how many acres of national forest or what percentage of the country it is that they covered? Would you believe 10% of the entire 48 states is in national forest land? That's a big chunk of land. Now, if you're not able to relate what an acre is, a football field in between the stripes is just a little over an acre. An acre by itself, he said, a square one is about 208 feet each way. So it's a pretty good sized chunk of land, about 193 million acres is what's in the National Forest. Now, 74% of it is out here. The other 26% is 13% is in the east, and Alaska makes the other 13%. So it's a big place out there. Now, how the forest got started is, it was a hard road to hoe in the beginning. Mm -hmm. But people in the East were getting very concerned about or becoming a timber famine. And what they were basing it on was reports in the, in the papers and so forth and, and hearsay. But off heavy timber cutting was taking place right up in here and particularly over here in the lake states. And the loggers were beginning to say, well, we better go down south and get some of this and let's go west. There's a lot of timber out there. And they were right. There was a lot, there was a lot of land out there because it was all in the, we call it national domain. The government really had all that land. Now there's two laws that we had there that came into play. One was a homestead law, and that's where people could could go out and ask to have a homestead a certain place, and they'd be assigned what it was. Usually about 160 acres. Sometimes they were larger. In fact, two big railroads out there got like 45 million acres just between the two of them, and that was because. President Lincoln was urging people to go west. Well, a lot of people went west, but a lot of them also came back, because that was a tough place to be in. You didn't have stores you could run to real easy out in that country. There was a lot of fraud that was going on, too. People wouldn't, they had to, to get a claim approved, you had to live on it for five years and put a dwelling on it. Well, some people wouldn't last that long and they'd go away. Instead of the land always reverting back to the public domain, they would sell it to somebody else. You have to wonder sometimes how these humongous ranches ever were able to acquire so much land. You have to figure it out yourself. I've got my own opinions what happened, but anyhow. The, uh, that was the first thing that happened that, that affected the Forest Service with all these people buying up land that was mostly grazing land. And then the next thing that came along was the, the Mining Act. And that was in the early 70s. And you could stake a claim anywhere on that open land 
and you paid five dollars for what they called a patent, and that allowed you to disturb 25 square feet of the surface. It'd be enough to put an opening into a side of a mountain or whatever. And then you paid too much an acre for the less of your land where you underneath where you might want. And a lot of people aren't aware that law gave a prospector the right of ownership to whatever they found. It's still on the books. Still on the books. Government doesn't get a penny for that. Well, a lot of that's quieted down. It was pretty lucrative back then, but it was also a very hardship to get to it. So anyhow, Go ahead, Dal. If you want to yeah. hear something. Well, it's just quite a history lesson to learn all of the, the laws that were involved in the formation of the um, National Forest Service, uh, as well as um, one other thing that you mentioned in terms of the uh, law enforcement. And I was just wondering uh, what kind of issues you ran across, and of course we live in an area where we might be known for moonshining, and so was that something that you ran across occasionally? Yeah, let me add something in there first sure. before we go into that. Sure. The, the people that work on the forest, you have to start with the chief who's in Washington, D.C. There's only one chief. Then you come down to what the regional offices, and you can't see it on these marks, but I uh, hear these outline what regions. There's nine of those. California by itself is a region. There's so many national forests in it that one regional forester. So there's nine forest uh, supervisory forests, and there's this was in 2007, because I can't get a, get a newer copy of anything. I think they quit putting them out. But anyhow, you know, there was 508 district rangers. They're below the forest supervisor. So you got the chief, the regional forester, forest supervisor, and the district ranger. The district ranger is the one who gets the work done. The rest of it's advisory up here. I always say, why so many? But anyhow, I don't run the outfit. <laughs> but anyhow, there used to be a lot more. There was close to 800 districts when I was a district ranger. They were, they were, the crew that you had was very small. One time, I had four people, that was it, including me, to, to run everything. Made it made it tough, and you always had more work assigned to you than you could possibly ever get done. So I don't think you ever heard a district ranger say, "What am I going to do with my extra time?" You didn't have any. Didn't have any. You were always on call if you needed. They needed you somewhere for another district to help out. Somebody got sick, got hurt, whatever, and that's just the way the things operated. You had. The, the uh, supervisor's office also provided additional people for assistance on whatever things you had. You were expected to do your own timber marking, take care of your own fires, take care of everything that was on there, get your own crews together and so forth. Things have changed. Nowadays, we don't have fire wardens. We used to talk to people out in, lived out in the, the timbered area, and they would agree to get their own people together if we had a fire. So that's who we called, and they would just gather up whoever they had. Well, they changed the rules so that uh, everybody had to master what they called a step test to, to test your physical fitness. Didn't want anybody getting out there that wasn't able to do the work, which is pretty tough. A lot of times, we, particularly out west, we'd, have to, we'd go into a bar 
and clean up whoever's in there and say, you're on a fire crew. You sober up on the way, but you're coming with us. That's the only choice you had. But nowadays they have what they call hotshot crews and they're scattered around mostly out west. Occasionally we have one or two here in the east. But those people have been well trained by us. And they take training after training. They're, they're pretty self-sufficient people too. But they work their tails off. So now what we used to have what we called the 10 a.m. fire control. If a fire happened on, say, my district, by 10 a.m. the next day, I was charged with getting that fire out by then. Made it tough when it started late, late in the evening, almost midnight, and you're almost 10 a.m. the next day before you ever even got to the fire. But anyhow, if, it, if you didn't get it to the first 10 a.m., you got it to the next one. You didn't put it way off in the distance. Well, here just a few years ago, this was after I had left the district over at Covington, Virginia. They had a fire that burned 24,000 acres on that district. I couldn't believe it. And there's reasons for, for that. They didn't get in there because I don't want to disparage the women because we had some really good ones, but they didn't have the training to do the things and then they didn't face the danger, what they, con they considered much more of a danger than the average man would even think about. The fires in the East are not like the fires in the West. Most fires we have here when they burn, they're burning just a strip up through here. And, and if you're working on this side, making a fire line and something happens, you can jump over the fire and get in the black area. It's already burned. You're not gonna get run over. Don't try that out west. You see how they go. They just flare up. And most of our fires here in the east are in hardwoods. They don't get up in the tops of trees. Now, if you get into pine plantations down south, yeah, that happens. But mostly in the east, it's, it's, it's not very hazardous. If I had been a fire, or the, the district ranger on that district out there, we would not have lost that many acres. Because I, I never ran into a place, and I was all over those acres, that were too hard. There are very few places that you would actually have to stay clear of. So anyhow, that's, that's the way it worked. Uh, so we had to call the crew coming from, this crew happened to come from California. So by the time you call them there and they get that group together, get them back on a plane, get them a place to stay here in the East, that doesn't happen in a few minutes. It may take two or three days. Well, by that time, you don't have a little fire that if the people had attacked it at the right time, could have saved it. Now you've got a humongous fire, and not only the damage, total damage it does, but the cleanup costs afterwards. So there was a question. There's a lot of people who say, well, we ought to let, let them burn. There's too much underbrush in the tree. Just having an uncontrolled get out there and burn an area versus a planned burning is two different things. So people still argue that. I still say hit them while they're small, get it over with, and go ahead. So that's typical what happened. So with these fires that we were discussing um, that are happening right here today, um, what, what insights do you have that would give us some idea of why they're so massive at this time and, and uh, affecting so many acres of, of our, our forests? 
and otherwise. Well, out west, a lot of the timber stands out there are very dense. They're not, they're not all pure conifers, but most of them are. And we have them, you've got limbs quite often that come clear down close to the ground. So even though you get a low ground fire started, it doesn't take very long till it gets up in the trees. And then you have the possibility of a, of a crown char. The last one I was on was in Michigan. And it, was, it started out as a prescribed burn by, by the Forest Service. And we're trained to get weather people in there and give us up to dates all the time. What's happening? What's happening? You know, is it okay to do this? Yeah. Well, I got the okay to do it. But then like the weather it has its own mind sometimes what it's going to do, it started acting up. And it circled a guy who was making a, a fire line with a bulldozer. And actually, we lost him on that. He was killed. But the fire went 14 miles from one morning about 10 o'clock to about 6 o'clock that evening. That's how far it went in a straight line. We thought we was going to have to evacuate the town that was the other end. We finally got it, got it done before, but it got into a crown fire, and the wind was taking it right down through the, where all the pines were, red pines. And so we also burned down a fire station. Wow. That was a little embarrassing. <laughs> yeah, after the fire station was out at a, a lake, and it just encircled the whole thing. And that's what happens when you have a lot of conifers. The other thing is we talk about a lot of forest fires out there, but a lot of those big fires are not involving forests as such. They're brush fields. And the oil that's in some of those shrubs is pretty flammable. So once it gets started, it's like throwing grease on a fire. Away they go. And you don't have a, a, a particular line moving. You, you may have a big long front going. It's pretty tough to get your arms around something like that. That's why they get so large. The other thing is we got sued several times by private groups to prevent us from thinning timber sands out west. If you get the trees separated a ways, chances of getting the crown fire are much less. Now, I got a couple of pictures here somewhere I'll show you if you want. Show the difference between an unthinned sand and a thin stand. Makes a big difference. But anyhow, I'll mention one other thing. There's a group called the Sierra Club. You've probably heard of it, may even be members of it. The Sierra Club's done a lot of good things, but when they started getting into trying to dictate timber management, they did like some big companies did. Instead of sticking to their own goals that they had for years, they branched out. And they found out it wasn't a good place to branch out, so they pulled back. Well, one time in Michigan, I attended a meeting and we had a, a the, the state representative of the Sierra Club spoke and she stood up and she made a flat statement. It's our intention in the, in the Sierra Club is to stop all timber sales on the national forest. Well, that's a pretty dumb statement to make in public. And she may have thought that, but she anyhow, she made it in public. And that's what we, we fought for years. Some of you probably remember when there was a lot of controversy about clear cutting That was a game of gotcha. They would write in to us, and, and all it took was an end, uh, well, whatever the price of a stamp was, or if you had a postcard, you could send that in and say, here, I got a problem with this. So we'd have to address it. Well, some of that stuff doesn't, you just don't make a one sentence reply, and that's it. 
take some research to get around what they're after. But it never failed, you'd send it back and they'd read it over and they'd say, oh, but you didn't answer this. Well, no, we didn't, you didn't ask that. So around and around we'd go like this, back and forth. Boy, I tell you, we put to death a lot of pulp trees to make the paper that it took to answer all that stuff. Meanwhile, that stopped us from doing the regular work we were supposed to be doing on the forest. We couldn't get anything else done and, and we had a lot of people just get burned out, too much writing, answering this and that, and so forth. And if people would come into the office, wherever you were, and, and explain what they wanted, so it was much simpler, you could deal with it, and maybe satisfy the customer, but when they played it, the game of sending them back and forth, so forth. I was on a plane one time with a senator, a U.S. senator, and we were going to uh, Chicago, and he was a member of that. He's, and he told me, he said, uh, if we have a problem with the Forest Service, he says, we have certain people we call, and they're obligated to call 10 more. And some of those people do 10 more. And he said, we can blanket Chicago in one day and just flood your desk with stuff. I was sitting there, you know, <laughs> all you could do is say, well, we don't appreciate that, but we don't have any say about it. What, so we've had a lot of problems with that. Now, were there other ways in which you communicated with the public, such as radio programs and newsletters and things of that nature? Yeah, the, uh, the bordering ranger, me, he, he was from up in Hot Springs, Virginia. He and I would get together in Kentucky, or Kentucky, in, in uh, Covington at the radio station, and we would have a monthly radio program there. They'd donate to us free. And uh, we would tell the people what we were doing and what we were planning on doing, and it went over great. I remember he, the lady that was going to tape it for us, she said, do you want to go live or you want me to tape it? And uh, so she said, well, let's try one light live. And of course, John, he made a little error and he said the word, the word he shouldn't have said. <laughs> she said, I believe we'll go back to the tape. So that's what we did from then on. It was a lot simpler. But anyhow, the very few people in the Forest Service ever used, used the broadcast to do it. But the guy who was the first chief of the Forest Service, a guy by the name of Pincho, one of the statements he made was, use the press first, last, and always. And this was a good, a good advice. You don't try to conceal anything because it's eventually going to come out somebody. And, and you can see this happening all over the Congress. <laughs> Stuff does come out after a while. Indeed it does. Yeah. yeah, okay. So I want to go back to that subject about the moonshiners. You told me a few stories and they were <laughs> very intriguing. So I think that uh, being that that's a part sort of of, of our area, um, I think we'd like to hear about it. Well, you know, we ran into, on, particularly on the east side of the Blue Ridge going up, there's a lot of springs on that side of the mountain, more so than on the west side. So they're great places to set up a moonshine sale. Well, we had one timber sale that was going to start down at, at the mouth of the creek and go clear up to where it joined the Park Service. It was, I remember it was, I think 890,000 feet of saw timber, big trees, and it was in rhododendron that would be up as high as that grill there in the wall. Thick, you could hardly fight your way through it. But every once in a while we'd be plowing through there and all once you'd come out in a little opening, you'd run into a path that, 
that the moonshiners had made to get to their still. Well, when we saw a still like that, we just kept on going. We never stopped asking questions or anything. There usually wasn't anybody there to ask anyhow. The ABC board would fly over the areas looking for smoke. It didn't, that wasn't a real good way to do it because they would burn chestnut. Chestnut, if anybody ever burned it, burned pretty hot, but it doesn't put out much smoke. But then after a while, they got so where they, they went into a barn and, and used propane to, to make cook it all. But to get back to this one place, we found five stills on that one cell. They were unbelievable. Well, after we had left their ways, we had heard that there was a, they, uh, the ABC board had told us that they had found a still out in that area. Well, we didn't turn them in. These were people that we had to rely on when we had a fire. We wasn't about to turn them in. They were entrepreneurs. <laughs> they just hadn't paid the taxes. But anyhow, Apparently what had happened, this one guy was coming up to take care of his steel, and he was reaching down into a barrel like this to dip, get a can of mash. And the agent was, must have been standing off to the side and must have moved or something and cracked a twig or something like that. He made a noise, and anyhow, the guy looked around like that. Click, the guy took a picture of him looking right out, and his hands down the barrel, but looking out to the side. And they made an eight by 10 of that, and they put it down in Buena Vista in the drugstore in the window. Well, everybody in town knew who, knew who the guy was. We had nothing to do with it, no way. But uh, they sure got, up, got caught up with him. Another time, they came in the office one day and asked the ranger there, I was just starting at that district. If you could get down. Oh, Lordy, I forgot I even had that thing. Uh, yeah. What was I saying about a. They asked the ranger. They asked him about is there a way to get down from the fire tower up on Bluff Mountain down over the mountain on a road? He said, well, there's an old road down there, but I wouldn't even call it a road. He said, we don't go down it, and it's pretty steep. We wouldn't advise it. So the guys thanked us, and they left. A few days later, the ranger says, come in, he says, hey, take a look at this letter. And I read it, and he says, dear Bill, he says, thanks for the advice on the road. He says, by the way, though, it, you can get down it, and we did find the biggest bust that we've ever had in that part of the county. So again, they looked right at us that they're hiding them again. Well, we were just trying to say a safe thing. We don't do it. We wouldn't ask you to go down it either. But there was, a, there was no end of stills down in that way. It seems like there's a delicate balance, natural resources and human resources. So. Um, your role with the Forest Service was to um, keep your resources available to you because of the things that you may need the, the residents, the local, local residents to assist your endeavors. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, the, uh, well, let's see. I, I made a list one time to show my own kids so they know what I did when I wasn't any here to ask anymore. Uh, what did I have down here? I put it. I know it entails quite a bit just from what you shared with yeah. us today. Yeah. Let me read some of the things. What I called it was I said some of the jobs I did in forestry. I'll read them real quick. I remarked boundary lines with red paint. I helped survey a new purchase boundary. I purchased a road right away. I cleared land trespass problems, inspected summer residence permits, inspected all types of special uses, 
served as head of a fire crew while in college, led fire suppression crews different places, inspected fire lookout towers, conducted the first prescribed burn on the forest, served as an air tanker evaluator in Boise, Idaho, detailed the major fires in Maine, Idaho, California, and Michigan, was selected one of the first three employees to receive a master's degree in fire management at Yale, caught and prosecuted timber thefts, wildlife, fire violators, and I think I mentioned that headed that law, st law enforcement study. Stocked trout, planned water, wildlife water holes and food plots, erected a demonstration five acre deer exclosure, conducted deer hunter dispersion surveys, prepared timber appraisals and contracts, conducted timber bidding sales, counted U.S. stamp locust post sales, conducted seedling survival surveys, led timber stand improvement crews, and planted 185,000 seedlings in one operation in Pennsylvania, cruised and marked timber for sale, reconned and marked timber sale boundaries, stopped the use of stump roads in favor of planned road locations, located miles of logging roads, pruned crop trees, conducted insect damage surveys, conducted trail inventories, marked new trail locations, developed brochures for all kinds of recreation areas and trails, established canoe and fisherman quotas, uh, and moved canoe landings back. This would be the parking areas so that all the canoes didn't get put right down on the water. Let them carry them away. I canoed the Pine, the Miramar, Pure Marquette, the Little Manistee, the White, and the Osable Rivers, and two of those became National Scenic Rivers. Had a radio program, I mentioned that, wrote articles for newspapers, spoke for, before all types of organizations and clubs, pushed for more and better signing for the public. You're out there in the middle of the woods and nowhere, you'd like to have a few signs, some people will. Played the part of a district ranger in a multiple use movie made by the Forest Service in 1961. And it was premiered at the Greenbrier Hotel in 1964. Served as one of three U.S. Forest Service employees at the White House Conference on Natural Beauty. That was President Johnson's wife at that in 1965. Set up a forest technology program, and I went to that. I prepared ranger district and supervisor office budgets, managed finances, served as management consultant, and went through that. Set up a newly formed ranger district, prepared short and long-term work plans, conducted annual appraisals and ratings for employees, and attended many training sessions. I woke up every day in a different world, it seemed like. There was never any question, of, do you have any work you need to do? Yes, 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 had plenty. <laughs> that is quite an impressive resume and uh, such a, a wonderful, um, such wonderful service that you provided uh, the, the Forest Service as well as all of us who enjoyed the, the bounty of your labor. Yeah. And um, we certainly do commend you and uh, certainly do appreciate you sharing such wonderful information. I think that we all learned a lot, especially as it relates to how all this got started, how the U.S. Forest Service got started and why it is so important. And so we certainly do thank you You're for welcome. sharing your insights and your expertise with us today. Yeah, well, I'm glad to do it. If anybody's got a question they want to ask me, far away. I'll stay here and talk to you. That's wonderful. Okay. And um, does anyone have any questions? We do have an, an in, in chapel studio audience, and we thank you all for joining us today. And also, um, we also remember the courageous men and women who are fighting these fires today. And um, I, there are almost a dozen here listed on this map. 
uh, that Mr. Lockhart was involved in battling as well. So we just thank all of the courageous men and women who um, put forth those efforts to protect our natural resources as well as conserve and preserve um, these precious resources that we all enjoy. And um, I just really do appreciate uh, your time. And mm -hmm. we've worked together on this. And uh, the stories, and he, you know, he's had so, he has some good stories. And he's quite witty. And so I have enjoyed learning about the Forest Service and also learning more about you, Mr. Lockhart. So we appreciate you mm -hmm. for your time. And mm -hmm. the only guest we were missing was, is Bart. Mr. Lockhart's uh, trusty companion, and he wasn't able to be here today. However, we do invite you to um, get involved with those, uh, with the councils that are here on campus that focus on preserving our natural resources right here, and I know you have expressed an interest in doing so. So that is really just the, what's so wonderful about Richfield Living is not only do we have such wonderful and influential people like Mr. Lockhart right here in our flock that have spoken to us today, but all of the possibilities that exist as a result of having so many wonderful resources right here in our midst, in our flock. So we look forward to you all joining us the next time one of someone from our flock will speak here on Geese Speaks. Thank you very much, and I hope you all have a wonderful day. affectionately referred to as JCT, this